The problem with personality disorders in general, and there's these lists of personality disorders, um, and one of them is narcissistic personality, and there's psychopathic personality disorder, schizophrenic personality disorder, these different personalities, borderline. Mm-hmm. That in the end, they're just terms for personalities we don't like. Mm-hmm. I'm too much of an extreme. There's and not, it's not clear cases, as an illness or anything. Well, it is often also conditions that make the people themselves suffer, but not always. Yes, and narcissism always. is a good example. You know, it's it's one of the the one of the things that make a mental illness a mental illness in any sense is the person suffers, the person does badly. Well, you know, when you, it, to the extent that that you get presidents who get described maybe accurately as narcissists or psychopaths. Mm-hmm. This is, just calls into question whether or not these things really are mental disorders in an interesting way. Yeah. Now, you mentioned in your book, Thomas Saz, is it S Z A Z, who wrote what, The Myth of Mental Illness or yep. something? I always now, pronounce it Zaz. Yeah. Okay. Now, part of his deal, uh, I think there was kind of a, a left wing and right wing part of yeah. his critique in a way. The, the, the left part, well, didn't he think that to some extent mental illness is a designation that the authority structure uses to marginalize dangerous people? That's exactly right. He thought it stripped people of free will, of, of their, sorry, of their their moral responsibility and their, their uh, it demeaned them. Mm-hmm. So you, you draw an analogy to dissidents in the old Soviet Union who were often brought to psychiatric hospitals. And it was like, right. you know, these people, it's not that these people are, are, are have views we hate. To have these views makes one deranged, not worth taking seriously, sick. And, and mm-hmm. Zuz argued that that was, in some ways, how we thought of how, how mentally ill people were treated in the rest of the world. Yeah. I guess I was thinking the left-wing part was the idea that it is used to marginalize uh, dangerous radicals. And the right-wing part was that it, that it has the effect of uh, uh, insulating people from moral responsibility or something. But I'm That's not right. – does that make That's sense? Right. That's right. And, and, and what it shares is a kind of general dislike and contempt and, and real worry about psychologists and psychiatrists that I think are shared in different ways from the left and from the right. Yeah. You know, from 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 the right, these people are seen as these establishment, often very woke people who are who are, you know, dominating other people's lives. From the left are seen as, you know, tools of authoritarian governments molding people into shape. Mm-hmm. And, and right now there's a big neurodiversity movement. Right. Arguing that that disorders that well, the states of being that we had once considered to be disorders are actually just other ways of living. Yeah, actually, uh, one thing I saw in your book that I hadn't really appreciated uh, it was about autism. I was very aware of the fact that um, apparently one thing that's sometimes compromised uh, by people in people who are in the spectrum is this theory of mind apparatus where yeah. you're good at understanding what's going on in other people's minds. The thing I hadn't realized, which you note in the book, I mean, it makes sense. And I'm wondering if it's related to the 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 uh, the kind of empathy, cognitive empathy thing, is that uh, people with autism are sometimes uh, less susceptible to cognitive biases and better yeah. at just thinking rationally. And I was wondering if those two things are related because Understanding what's going on in people's minds is related to, to 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 knowing what they think about you, and it's related to caring what they think about you, and and that triggers all kinds of distortions of thought, right? And I'm thinking of Elon Musk. He says he's on the spectrum, yeah. and by the way, that could lead us back to narcissism, and m- maybe we'll go there. But he says he's on the spectrum. He probably is very good at rational thought. One explanation for a lot of what he does is that he either doesn't understand how people view him or doesn't care. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. I, that, does that make sense that those two things are connected? Yeah. Yeah, it might. I mean, I, I got this from a, a, a book that uh, co-authored by Tyler Cowen, who talks about the right. strengths and weaknesses associated with different variants of neurodiversity. Um, so and, and autism, one strength might be a sort of hyper rationality. That makes them less subjects to, and I, I, I can see that could go with the symptom, with the syndrome in general. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the neurodiversity thing sometimes gets overblown. Um, I take in, in the end a very traditional view, which I actually hold very strongly, which is that some things are just horrible, and and we and getting a cure from be wonderful. 
extreme obsessive compulsive disorder, phobia so bad you can't leave the house, depression so bad you're just stuck in bed sobbing all day, schizophrenics mm -hmm. who can't live by themselves, people with autism who can't speak and can't maybe can't toilet themselves, have to be treated. I think cures for those should be treated as just as good as cures for, for cancer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think in some ways, schizophrenia could be nice, nicely analogized in a terrible way to cancer. But then you get a sort of natural range. And I agree with the neurodiversity movement that in some cases, there are strengths and weaknesses associated with being on the range. And strange phrase, um, that, that being, being in different places on this. Um, maybe in some, in some contexts, it, it, autistic people have an advantage over, over the neurotypical. Mm -hmm. Susan Cain has made a place for the, the power of introverts. Right. And also, you know, if you're a salesperson, being an introvert sucks. But yeah. for all sorts of other things, being an introvert could be great. Um, in some situations, being a little bit neurotic is probably an advantage in a case where there's an unstable and dangerous world. Um, and so, so these different personality types and different ways of being can be useful. And I have some sympathy for people who say that before you go too far on the extremes, but within a certain, a certain amount, maybe the world should change and not demand that these people change. Maybe we mm -hmm. should make offices more amenable, spaces more amenable to people on the spectrum, people who are extreme introverts, people who are anxious in different ways. Yeah. Thanks for watching Non-Zero Clips. The clip you just watched is from the overtime segment of a Non-Zero podcast episode. To hear the public portion of that episode and others like it, subscribe to the Non-Zero YouTube channel or Non-Zero podcast feed. And to gain access to overtime segments and other exclusive content, subscribe to Robert Wright's Non-Zero newsletter on Substack.